listening to My Morning Cup, a podcast that features interesting conversations with genuine people. I'm your host, Mike Costa of Costa Media Advisors. My guest this week is Chanda Chambers, owner and president of Chambers Welding and Fabrication, in addition to Metal Makers. Chanda stands out as a woman in the male-dominated world of welding and metal fabrication. But her story doesn't start there. Chanda, welcome to My Morning Cup. Before we talk about how you went from Army medic to human resources professional to metal fabrication, let me ask, what is in your morning cup? Big coffee cup. Black? Yes, I do not put anything in my coffee. And I like it cold when it's summer, and I like it warm when it's winter. Do you have a cutoff time during the day, or do you just drink coffee all day? So I went to Emwa Station in Puerto Rico, and we would drink coffee throughout the whole day. You could buy a cup of coffee for no more than 25 cents. That's not a Starbucks, is it? <laughs> Let me tell you something. It was some of the best coffee I've ever had. They called it Cafe Con Leche. It was delicious. Mm. Cafe Con Leche, that'd be coffee with milk. That's right. And the milk is condensed, so it's really sugary. So yeah. you're just getting a double boost. I think they were the original energy drink people. <laughs> the the original monster drink. That's yeah, right. Yeah. Well, welcome to My Morning Cup. I'm so glad you came in. I got to meet you a couple of years ago when I was doing a communications class with women in construction and had a lot of fun and got to know you then. But I've uh, watched you over particularly social media over the years and love your story. So let's talk about that. Where did you grow up and go to school? Let's start the timeline and let you take us through that. Sure. So my mother and my father met in the civil rights movement. My mother was actually a violinist in New York, and my father went up there for a march. And that's how they really met. My mother is white. My father is black. He lived in Alabama, Auburn, Alabama. My mother decided to go down there. Oh, God bless her. <laughs> my mom decided to go down there. If you ever have met my mother and know my mother, my mom is a force. She's one to work in with. And so I could see her totally making her path down there to Tuskegee, where she went to the university. At the time, it was the Institute. And I think mm -hmm. she was one of the first white women to ever go to Tuskegee at the time, which I thought was unique. I spent 18 months running some TV stations in Montgomery, Alabama. Oh, yeah. And the history there is incredible. You, you mentioned Tuskegee, home of the Red Tails. And in downtown Montgomery, I had an apartment on Dexter Avenue right in front of the bus stop where Rosa Parks would catch her bus. And oh, yeah. Up towards the Capitol and across the street was the Dexter Avenue Baptist Church where Dr. King was the pastor and started the whole boycott movement. And it's an interesting city because of that history. And there's a certain group there that's really embracing it and wanting to tell the story. And I think there's good things ahead for Montgomery if they continue to go down that path, not the least of which would be the uh, oh, the Civil Rights Museum they have down mm -hmm. there. Um, I forgot the name of it. I can't even remember the name. It'll come to me as we talk. Yeah. So that's how your parents went. Where'd you grow up? Uh, things didn't work out. There was such a drastic difference. It was just not a good combination of two souls. It was great that they got together and they tried to raise a family, but it's just hard circumstances. You're talking about 60s, a mixed couple in Alabama. So <laughs> that'd be really tough. It is. Yeah. So all of that being said, she ended up going in the Navy. My mother decided just to pack her bags up in the best way for her to support her family was maybe to serve. And so that's what she decided to do. And so that really started my life of just traveling. We would go somewhere every three years. We lived in Seattle. We lived in San Diego. We lived in uh, Texas because my sister, my, when my mom would have to go on long deployments, my sister would take care of me because she's quite older than me, about 15 years. Oh. So, you know, at that time, she had got married herself and she was in Colleen, Texas. We're very military oriented. And so I did a lot of travel. I just did a lot, a lot of traveling. So you were the new kid in school quite a bit. All the time, which made it great when I was a kid because I get to recreate whoever I wanted to be. If I wanted to be the cool <laughs> kid next time, I knew how. You know, so I always made it very clever. I didn't see a bad side of it. I actually got to a point some places I was like, oh, I'm ready to go. <laughs> you know, I think that that's a wonderful thing because I'm able to travel. You can pick me up from Chattanooga and drop me somewhere else and I would be fine. Well, that's such an interesting perspective that you pointed out of always being the new kid, because a lot of times you hear how tough it is. And it is tough being the new kid, but it you is. embraced it. 
I'm a different cat. <laughs> I, I look for the opportunity in everything. I think that it's whatever you create your situation. If I create my situation to be that it's a horrible situation, even if it is a horrible situation, it has a lasting effect on you for the rest of your life, whether you become something great or not. And so I just won't. Even right now, like my world can be crashing. I'm still going to come in here and laugh with y'all and have the best time and think of things differently. Hopefully have something impact me during this time where it just changes my perspective. So yeah. I look at things positive and find it out and find a, you know, a wonderful feeling of accomplishment from even my mistakes. You've learned to embrace the present. That's right. And not right. worry about what's going to happen tomorrow or fret about what happened yesterday. And that's a hard thing to do, but such a healthy way to live. Well, you know, I think I still, because I'm a Virgo and I'm very worrisome about every damn thing. I want to be the most successful Virgos, baby. We're organized in life. We're going to make a whole plan for everybody. Everybody <laughs> around us, you got a plan and you get a plan. So, <laughs> No, that, it doesn't escape me from worrying, uh, but it does allow me to be okay when people fail. Yeah. And I think that's important. Like my daughter says she wants to be an orthodontist. If she doesn't become an orthodontist, I wouldn't care. I'm so proud of her accomplishments right now with her going to Baylor and being the best person she could be by going to different college fairs and her plans and all this stuff. So I'm just a proud parent. That's a great, great way to be. And I'm learning more talking to you in these first five minutes. <laughs> so thank you, because I like that perspective. So you're doing a lot of moving around. And where does that take you when you decide to join the Army? So I actually, I didn't look at the military like most people did. A lot of people look at the military as it's honorable to serve. I looked at it as the natural way of life, because everyone around me was doing it. So, of course, I wanted to do something different. I was like, I'm going to go to college. I'm going to be the first one to go to college and not go through the military to get to college. But that didn't work for me because I had a kid very young. Yeah. So the first thing that popped up in my head was I need to go in the military. And so that really started my career path. Now, just to let you know how military oriented we are, my mom served, my brother served, I served, my son serves, my niece serves. Uh, my sister was married to someone who served. So I don't know anything other than <laughs> serving. I think my daughter is the only one who doesn't know about the serving lifestyle, and which is wonderful. Don't get me wrong. We owe your family and you and your family a debt of gratitude and thanks. Thank you for serving. Thank you. It was such an honor to serve. Uh, when you go in the military, it's such an experience because they teach you discipline. And if you don't have discipline, then this is going to be your hardest route of getting it. <laughs> yeah. But it's good for you. It's good for you in so many ways. I don't think it's just those who don't have discipline. Structure is another one. Those who don't have structure don't know how to form structure. Military gives you all those things. And if I did not go in, I wouldn't be the success I am today. Because it just mixed well with who I am and who I became. Once I served, I ended up going to Puerto Rico. It was a wonderful experience. I ended up going to D.C., um, not D.C. itself. I ended up going to Virginia, Fort Belvoir. After that, I ended up getting out. Um, I served my time. I was a nurse in the military, so I wanted to go into a field where I can make great money. Mm -hmm. Again, with the mindset of what my mom and everyone else told me. I need to have a career that pays me money, you know, so not dreaming, just steadily following one thing that I'm used to doing, which is the military to another, which someone said, this is the best way you make money. Not dreaming, though. Yeah. And we talked about that a little bit, that the path for so many is find a good job that is steady, pays good money and allows you to live a life. And that doesn't necessarily fulfill that dreaming aspect or really fulfill you in terms of what you can do or want to do. I think a lot of times we ourselves have gone through experiences as parents that says this would be the best path for you because it's the safest path. You know, if you start it right now when you're in elementary school and I say for your education, I'm going to set you into the best career you could ever have. And I think we don't do enough on that part of it. You know, you don't per se have to plan your child's life, but you do need to make sure that they're consciously, you know, mentally strong because this world is crazy. It is. <laughs> so I think that when we look at 
traditional education versus non-traditional education. I think that that choice belongs to the child of what they feel they're best at. I just feel like we as parents need to build their self-esteem, build their mental stability, and make sure that they're sound as we let them leave the home. You mentioned a word, and I think it fits exactly for what you're saying, is safest. Yep. As a parent, you want your kid to be safe, taken care of, and a lot of times those career paths are go study this, go become That's a nurse, right. go do that. You might have a dream of owning a metal fabrication shop, but you know what? Being a nurse is going to pay and you're going to have a good life. That's right. And I think we do focus on the income of the child, but like I said, not the mental part of the child. Mm -hmm. That child will make money if they're mentally able to sustain this world. This world is crazy. And why I say that is because emotional intelligence, let's just take that one when dealing with situations. I used to burn bridges like you wouldn't believe. I would say, oh, I don't care about this. This is crazy. He's crazy. All this is crazy. Well, you can't do that in a male dominant world. You might be able to do that in a woman's world. Hmm. I never looked at it like that. Why is that? Because I have known men to have an argument one minute and go play golf the next. Now that's true. And so I'm not, I want to go play golf with you too. Hell. <laughs> so I don't want to burn bridges. You know, that goes back to making sure the person that you're raising is sound. They can understand an argument. They can understand that you can disagree to agree. That emotional state where we just road rage gives me a great clue of that. Like yeah. you just can't control your emotions. So you have to physically hurt someone because they cut you off. There's a great line in The Godfather. It's only business. To your point of men can have an argument and then go play golf because there's that separation of the emotional and its business. I think it's something that when as a woman owned business, and I know I'm all over the place because we talked about military and my upbringing. <laughs> <laughs> well, we're going to get to your human resources and everything else, but I love where we're going. You know, that was the part of being a woman owned business. When people ask me, what is the hardest part? It's not really dealing with men. It's dealing with myself dealing with men. Because I think that I have to understand, one, their perspective of things. And then I have to have my perspective because it's going to be different. And I have to have valid points to make sure that I can persuade you. But what I can't do is close the discussion where you're not willing to talk to me anymore. Mm -hmm. So I had to really learn to deal with my emotions when dealing with people. And then Boundaries are a big one. Like when I see them set off, I'm like, let's put a boundary up, <laughs> you mm -hmm. know. But I think our emotions have a lot to do with business. So when it comes to education, I have been around people who failed out of high school but still can run a business like you wouldn't believe. Mm -hmm. They are the best people to negotiate and to like I call them Southern charmers because they will make a great relationship with you and get you to sell or get you to buy. And I think that that has a lot to do with their emotional intelligence and how they deal with their customers and how they perceive people. And it's more of what I'm I think we should be doing. And it's something we don't work on. You know, it's something we don't teach in school. It's something that businesses don't focus on, but it really plays a big part in where you go in terms of the business. I think so, too. Even in a work environment where you don't own it, I think that you being able to work in a group and you being able to have team assignments and being able to get along with people. I think that's why we do a lot of personality tests. Because we say these are issues, but we don't address them. I think that should be a part of business school as well, you know, and probably is. Yeah. You know, probably is a lot of emotional intelligence. Well, and let's talk a little bit about your growth through that. So you get out of the military, you're a nurse, but you don't continue to do that. How long did you stay in the health profession and then human resources? Maybe a year. Oncology stage four cancer is very hardcore. And I am a lover of people. And so it's very hard to connect to someone and someone pass away. And I think that after a couple of times, you just become a little bit number. You see, a lot of times nurses back in the day when I was doing it, they would smoke. You know, they had a glass of wine, a bottle of wine, two bottles of wine. But it's because we're coping with it's what coping, we're doing. Yeah. And so I just was like, I don't want to do that. I was so young and I was just like, I don't want to cope, man. I yeah. don't want to cope. And so I ended up doing something where I went back to a school that was offered through the military at Southern Illinois, what allows military families to get a different degree or get a degree, excuse me. And uh, I ended up going for healthcare management. And mm -hmm. the management part was the part that I really enjoyed. 
And that really allowed for me to go into human resources. And it was just a funny story. I got out of the military and I was leaving uh, D.C. And I really didn't know my dad growing up. We traveled so much. And so I ended up going to Alabama and I told myself, I'm just not going to do that anymore. I'm going to do something else. I saved up plenty of money. And so I did. I paid for a year at this rental property right next to the college and I paid all my bills up and I sat there for a year. And that was life changing for me. I was down to like five hundred dollars at a bar. That's a horrible story. <laughs> but this is God. No matter how where you're at, it's just crazy. So I was at a bar. It was Ruby Tuesdays. It wasn't even a bar. I was at the bar sitting with this uh, Japanese gentleman and we were just talking and he says, I just opened up a plant down the street and I'm looking for a human resources manager. He was like, do you know of one? I said, I'm one. <laughs> How much does it pay? And he told me the price and I said, yep, I could do that job. I'm your, I'm your person. <laughs> he said, well, if you can for real, and you could tell he was so new to the area and he had a couple drinks and that's how I ended up going into human resources. Really? Yep. Send a thank you note to Ruby Tuesdays. <laughs> <laughs> the next day, I was very nervous about going up there because he was serious. Yeah. And he had called and he wanted to confirm. And so I was like, well, I just need to tell you something. I have no human resources experience, but I'm interested. And, in, you know, at this point, because I don't want to go back into nursing. Yeah. And I don't know what my calling is, but I need to do something. And he was like, well, I'm willing to try. So how did you get here then? You're a human resource professional in Alabama. I ended up coming to Chattanooga on a visit because I did human resources for a German company. We were actually stationed in uh, Atlanta and we had four locations. And, uh, you know, I decided I was going to come down here because I was going through a really bad divorce. And again, here comes opportunity. Mm -hmm. I said, well, I'm going to try, I'm going to try to stay here with this company. But then Volkswagen decided, Hey, we're not going to unionize. And so because I work for a German company in the automobile business and we work for BMW and uh, Mercedes, they were like, no, we're going to not allow this to happen. So you need to come back. And so I was like, well, they're about to move. And I just moved to Chattanooga, trying to escape my situation as far as the bad divorce and start over. What year is this? Uh, uh, 2014. And um, I end up saying, I don't want to do this anymore. And I took a year off. And I had money. Again, I'm very fortunate to try my best to save. I'm a big planner. You know, if I want to take off, I know what it takes to take off. So I did. And it gave me a year to spend with my daughter. I found a house in North Shore, another great opportunity. Mm -hmm. Particularly at that time. Well, there's this guy that blessed my life who was like, are you interested in moving here? And it was an older guy. He came into my life and he said, hey, I'm going to take you around town and show you all the great places you and your daughter would want to live. And when we went to North Shore, he was like, this is it for y'all. And so I ended up going on Craigslist and finding the place. And it was a doctor that was like, hey, I have this rental property. I'll rent it to you. And he later sells it to me all great opportunities. I took every single one, ended up in that area, came here and I met my husband. And during the time that I was being a great parent to my daughter at Normal Park and, you know, being able to see that lifestyle, develop friendships, this community here in Chattanooga is absolutely amazing. Special um, place. Just, I love the people here. I love the people. Tennessee is just a great state, period. So I come here, I meet my husband. My husband's like, really high ranking in what he does, very respected. And I'm like, I want to start a business. And he was like, I do too. And I was like, no, I'm serious. <laughs> I said, I've already dream of it. And he was like, okay, yeah. I don't think he thought it was really going to develop into what it is today. Mm -hmm. But he went along with it. All opportunities, all blessings. So what was the year you started Chambers Welding? 2015. Remember, I got here 2014. Yeah. So... Like I said, I've been very fortunate when things have presented an opportunity for me. Mm -hmm. I have always rise to the occasion because you only get one. You get that one opportunity. And I just want to make sure that I take each one. How much credit do you give the military for not just as a kid growing up in the military family, but yourself being in the military to give you that discipline to say, I know how to save. I know how to plan. And therefore, I can take a year off. The military really did not teach me how to say <laughs> it was quite the opposite i love spending money I was in the military. um but it did teach me about working with the team it did teach me how to give an order and receive an order 
It did teach me how to get up every morning, look for a job. When I have a job, give it 110 percent, do what I do, plus some. The mentality in the military is that it is a team that's going to win, not a person. So you're more orientated to work as a team and get it done. You said I learned how to give an order and take an order. Mm -hmm. Talk a little bit about that. Yes. So I am a very, um, I won't say aggressive, because that's a horrible thing to say about a woman. But I do not hold my tongue when it comes to our work. People around me have a harder time dealing with it than I do. And it is what it is. The military has. it. it when something needs to be done and people are not rowing, I have no problem turning to you and be like, you're the reason why we're not rowing. So you got a couple choices here and I can walk you through them. But at the end of this, you got to get it done. And if you can't, this ain't for you. And so after saying that to someone, it's just hard for them to kind of sometimes perceive the directness and the person that it may be coming from. But I don't know. Maybe you've never been talked to like that, you mm-hmm. know, or maybe whatever the case may be. But I don't have a problem with it. And I don't do it in a disrespectful manner, but I do it in a very direct manner so we can get commonly what needs to be done, done. I would imagine being direct is a benefit to the whole team rather than someone trying to figure out the nice words you're dancing around. I think if you were in a mix or co-ed environment, yes. I think that this is kind of how I differ. Not all women, when you say putting me as a woman in a male dominant environment, all of us are not the same. You know, some women are very passive. Some are more riding the line. I am just very black and white. And with that, I think that that gives you clear parameters of what you need to do. Mm -hmm. And I don't mix the unknown. I tell my husband all the time, there's things we have to have with everything we say. Who's assigned to it? What it is they need to do? Time frame, they got to get it done. You know, those things right there are so important for everyone to know uh, what they're required to do and when they need to get it done. Talk a little bit about what Chambers Welding does yeah. and, and how you've grown and how you're really taking welding in some of the classes you're offering to people who may not have ever considered it. Absolutely. So when I started, when we started Chambers, I started first because he was working a full time job. And so how I started it was that I did a lot of networking here in Chattanooga, just kind of figuring out who would be my customer I mean, I did everything. If there was an event in this town, I would go to it. And then I would talk about my business. The thing that kept creeping up whenever I talked about my business was the school. I really wanted to impact the community. I felt like we had a skill set that was so valuable that, you know, when I hired people for welders, they don't have to have a high school diploma or a clear background or, you know, some of them can even be disabled. It's such a variety of folks that can be hired in. Uh, So I really wanted to give them an opportunity to to do that, impact the crime, all the things. So when we first started Chambers, where we got a building, we outgrew the building within a couple of years, maybe a year and a half. We ended up going to another building. And in that space, we got equipment, thank God, to Pathway Lending. And we ended up starting to do more work a little after COVID. Like maybe a year later, I started seeing the impact of what happened You know, when COVID first was announced, I had no impact. I mean, yes, I had to make sure we had all the safety precautions and all the things, but I had no real true financial impact until later on. Then it was like people slow paid. They couldn't get stuff done. So on and so forth. There was a lag. for There was. That was the time to do the school. Yeah. And the reason why that was the time to do the school is because on the flip side, I was getting slow paid. But on the other side, I couldn't get quality people for what I was paying them before. I used to pay no more than 19 and that was on the high end. Now it's 25 just to get someone to come into the door. And it's one of those things where you say, "Okay, I'm charging a lot, but I'm getting the same quality people. And sometimes those folks didn't know how to do all the processes. They didn't have certain certifications. So I said the school will serve dual purpose, one to impact the community and then to impact the guys that come in so that I can save on them coming in, being better trained. You know, if I'm going to have to pay higher prices, let me make sure that they can do anything and everything I can get my hands on. And so that's really kind of how the school came about. Mm -hmm. Is the school geared more towards bringing people into welding as a profession, or do you also have an aspect of it of people who just want to be creative? 
So if you know my personality, if I see any of that, I'm going to try to capture all of it. Because everyone's like, what do you specialize in at Chambers? What's your niche? I was like, I don't have a niche. <laughs> I want it all. You know? <laughs> I know that's horrible. But there's a lot of people in town that have a niche. And I just see that they want to get out of that niche. So they start to add to that. I don't want to wait. I want to go ahead and go out there and do all the things that we're capable of doing. And the same thing goes with the school. I started off with just fun classes because I wanted to impact women. Then it went to, I want to impact kids. And then it's going to, I want more men to come in and be impacted by what we do over here, just teaching them. This is just fun classes, building beds, building you know knives, building swords, and all kinds of fun stuff that we can do together with metal, anything that you're interested in. But then it became, okay, what about professional development? That's my guys. They need to be able to mig, tig, stick. Some of them needs to be able to read a drawing. Some need to be able to do layouts, whether it's handrail or just a job layout. Some of them need to understand cleaning and the difference when you stain metal, because you can, you can make it blacker, darker, you can rest it. So we wanted to go more into some of those details. Those classes are really good for them. So we've done really well with the eight hour. We're introducing a 15 hour and we're going to have a 30 hour. So at the 30 hour, you should be able to be certified. Kind of a full circle there. You get people in, plus it feeds what you need in terms of welders and what other companies need. That's right. In terms of welders. You know, all of this right now that's happening in our city in regards to trade, it goes to the fact that we know they're needed. Mm -hmm. And we just need to make sure it's a career path, getting back to what we said from the we beginning. Everybody is not meant to go into college and everybody, every child may not share the same dreams as a parent we have for them. All we really need to do is get them mentally stable to go into any field that they decide to do and to give them an opportunity to do it. What a refreshing perspective. I think so. Yeah. A couple more questions for you. When you talked about starting your business, networking and everything, how important was being, uh, lack of a better term, a military brat, having to move around, try new schools? How important was that experience to you starting your business and being that new kid again in all those situations? That that was my superpower. When I have people work for me, I always tell them what their superpower is. You know, I got one guy, he will investigate something to you can't invest. That's a superpower. He will spend hours on it. And I'd be like, that was just a doorbell. <laughs> I need to bring you back. I said, but I do enjoy the fact that you know so much about this. So now that you know that person's superpower, you have to use it. And so that's what I did. My superpower is people. I'm really good because I've moved so many places, so many different towns, different personalities. So knowing people and talking to people is what I'm good at. Mm -hmm. That's why I went to that first. And it also gives you a temperament of the town. Are people going to be receiving to you? How do people feel about what you're telling them? How are you going to get business if people don't know where you're at or what you're going to do? That's another thing. Do you feel as though you could have had the same success in starting a business in another town? No. And why? I always say that. And I think people think that I'm just being sarcastic or I don't know. I have no clue. But it truly, truly is. You have people here who seek to help you. They look for opportunities to give and they look to promote you and to see you successful and high five you and support your business. And I have tried to have a business in Auburn in between the job that I had as a human resource. I decided to step out and do it. And the town wasn't as supportive. I mean, from the chamber, even the, you know, some of the structure that they had at the time there, it wasn't as structured as it is here. The chamber here, they want to meet you. They want to shake your hand. And then you have so many other things in this town besides just the chamber that want you to come out and network and know about whom you are to help you. It's just a great town, man. In talking to you, I realize how much you live in the present and appreciate what's in front of you. But this question is more about what's next. What's mm -hmm. next for you and chambers? To be honest with you, I want to bring it to its full potential and I want to sell it. I think that Chambers is wonderful, but Chanda's more than Chambers. Chanda was to start a business and she wanted to be successful at mm -hmm. it. And then she wanted to end up helping people with that business, which is metal makers. And I feel like those are all accomplishments. Now I need to make it extremely profitable, sell it, have a retirement plan so I can go out and do more good stuff. 
in our community here in Chattanooga and other places. You're a problem solver. I am a dang. That's another superpower, brother. You're naming them today. I've got them listed out. (laughs) Well, I've really enjoyed this conversation. I've got one last question for you, and I want you to think about this a minute. Think about your 25-year-old self. What would you tell that 25-year-old self is really important for a happy life? Stop making excuses of why you do not want to open a business and do it. Just stop. So Nike, just do it. Just do it, man. I think that I had it ingrained in my head that I would not be successful if I did not go off to college or be in a profession that's known to pay well. I needed that title to say that I was somebody, and that's not the case. Yeah, and I've talked to a lot of people about this, and it's something as I've gotten older, I've realized one of the mistakes I think we've made as a country in education is forcing a square peg into a Mm. round hole. College is not for everyone. It may give you a leg up in some circumstances, but it also can keep you in an area that you may not be thriving, but you're safe. Yeah. And it's not about being safe. No. It's about the individual. I will tell you that college has helped me in what I do. So I think there's a place for college, but I think that it has to be up to the person, the child, to make those decisions so that way they're able to be prosperous in anything that they do. Yeah. Well, Chanda, you're a very empowering person. You've got a great story and very inspirational, and I've learned quite a bit. Thank you for being on My Morning Cup. Thank you for having me. Thanks for listening to My Morning Cup, a podcast by Costa Media Advisors. If you liked this episode, please share it with a friend. I release a new episode each week, so be sure to subscribe on Spotify, Apple, Google, or wherever you listen to podcasts.